already. Okay. So here we are. Good morning. Good morning on the 17th of June. It's a lovely day, bit of a heat wave on the way in here. And um, yes, Humidex is up into the high, high 30s. And your ACs are in and you received your, your, your parcel, did you? Did yeah, you? I, uh, I had a little trouble opening it up, however. Did you? Okay. Yeah, there was so much tape on it. I thought the guy spent two hours. <laughs> yeah. He'll never right get here, it. Right here on my desk. Yeah, yeah. I, I tape myself. <laughs> To the pillow at night. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I can't get up. <laughs> and that that's only the first roll you that's use, right? That's just me. The, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God damn it. What the hell is... Okay. Is were, it all... Have you got it all plugged in now the way I told you? Is the, uh, is no, the, I, 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 I didn't get around to it. I'm oh, you sorry. didn't do it yet. Okay. No, so we're, we're, gonna, we're taking, we're working without a net again this morning. Okay. Let's just get going here because Jeffrey Dworkin is in the green room. And, okay. Uh, listen, I was, I was reading up some, some stuff. Jeffrey is a journalism teacher. He's worked for the CBC. He's worked for NPR. We'll talk about a bunch of different things. And I came across this piece written in the Canadian Jewish News by Ron Sillag, who's an old colleague of mine from way back, uh, 40 years ago, worked for the Suburban here in Montreal. Great reporter, right. great guy. Uh, and it's a piece entitled, How Canadian Journalists Cover Israel. This has nothing to do with what we're going to be discussing here necessarily. But uh, Jeffrey is quoted in here, and this is from 2016. So I will when refer... still at NPR, right? Uh, no, th this was after NPR. This is about 10 okay. years later, but he was talking about how newsrooms are functioning and how there's a pressure on them and how online uh, systems are affecting their work. So I will refer back to this piece. But I, the reason I bring this okay. up is I was reading about... Adrian Arsenault. I was reading about CJN. CJN has folded after 60 years. I, I did didn't not know, know this. That. They did, folded. Did it not begin here in Montreal? I, I believe so. I don't know much about the history, but I know it had been around for, for a long time. But they folded as of the 9th of April, if I'm, unless I'm mistaken. So a couple of months ago. Oh, my goodness. They're still Another winding. Outlet bites the dust. That's too They're bad. still winding down, unfortunately. It affected a lot of people, a lot of readers, too. And I felt really bad. Here's Ron Sillag. Here's my, uh, my friend, a guy I knew from way, way back. A uh, very nice man, very, very serious and earnest reporter, too. Worked for the Suburban. He's gone on to do many other things since then. But he and some colleagues have now launched the Canadian Jewish Record, which is a relatively new, I think it's online only, as far as I know. And so, the banner, Black Lives Matter. That's interesting. Yep. So they're, yep, they're, they're fighting and they're at it again. So uh, uh, long live CJR. And I'm, again, I'm very sad to hear about CJN folding. So Ron yeah, is, is part of the... I didn't know that. I, I'm sure, well, maybe Jeff knows, but I'm sure it was started here in Montreal. Uh, possibly. So uh, Ron is co-founder and editor of uh, the CJR. So you'll find that online. The, the reason I just bring this up is because I was quite surprised and saddened to hear about that so well, maybe we can talk to, uh, to Jeffrey about that and well, let's bring him in because he's got his cup of coffee he told me he's all set you knew Jeffrey from CBC News back in the day right uh, yeah Jeff uh, at that time was uh, good morning We're just, uh, Jeff just at connecting. that time was in television news I was still doing radio and then Jeff was a colleague of mine at, at TV news as well this goes back to the very late 70s early 80s good morning Jeff Good morning. Um, I seem to be frozen in place. No, uh, you're coming in just you're fine coming here. Coming in fine now. Yeah. Okay. It just I'm, I've got the the wheel of death, and it says waiting, which is appropriate. <laughs> okay. Oh, I guess. Okay. okay. That's because we gab for a while before we get to you. It. It, it's just to piss people off. That's right. Oh, okay. Well, it's did working. we succeed? <laughs> okay. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say you haven't changed a bit, pal. Move a bit. Yeah. To well, your, thanks for your love. Your for your Ability to lie with credibility. <laughs> <laughs> move a bit to your left there, bud. Move, move, there that's you it. Go. Better. You, now, you, now you're center screen. Oh, Been excellent. Much better. Uh, just tip your screen just a hair towards you a little bit more here so we can get a better shot of you. Uh, no, uh, the other way around. I'm sorry, the other, opposite other way. way. The opposite way. My, my fault. There we How's go. Okay. We'll, we'll take that. That's good, Jeff. We'll yeah, take that. Okay. Thank you. Now, as hair. we said in the CBC, close enough for government work. There yeah. you go. May, let's not get into that. Well, it'll take an hour just to do the CBC stuff. No, how are I'm you making it. out? In, how are you making out in the uh, in the pandemic here? Do you miss teaching? Uh, no, I'm I'm about to retire. I 
Um, I, I'm hanging up my my uh, academic skates in about 10 days. Oh. Uh, I, I've run the program for 10 years, and uh, it's time for some some younger, smarter whippersnapper to take over. Um, and I just, I've, I've got a textbook coming out, uh, being published in the States, uh, on uh, uh, trusting the news in a digital age. So that'll keep me going for a while. Well, that'll get timely. us into a, a number of subjects. David, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just wondering, Jeff, have you actually finished the writing or are you just editing now or what's the story? It's, I'm waiting for the galleys to come back from the publisher. Okay, so you, you, you oh, have you then, finished and your then part. I, and then I need to do an index. I'm gonna hire some young editor to do that for me and then we're off to the races. We're, now you say you're retiring. Were, were you teaching on the Zoom thing once COVID came in or had you had your uh, last class? I did seven weeks uh, during the end of the winter term uh, doing remote teaching and you know what, you guys will understand this as well. Um, I needed an audience. The idea of just speaking into the ether and not making any eye contact or getting any responses, I found it to be uh, less satisfying than my previous iterations where I go before a, an audience of about 100 or 120 students and that kind of energizes me. And I, I, it, is, it is performance is, is what teaching is. And so I'd, al I'd always planned to, uh, to, uh, to stop uh, running the program after this uh, academic year. So this actually really just confirmed to me that uh, it's time for somebody else to have a go at it. Remind Let's me the title of the book. Story. Again. You go after, after you. you. Sorry? You go ahead. The title after of the you. book is trusting the news in a digital age okay question was it was this easy to write was it born out of frustration and out of uh, um how shall i say i have, I, I have to say it, it was kind of the inspiration of teaching a course on sort of fundamentals of journalism to first and second year students many of whom were not from Canada, or at least their parents weren't from Canada. The University of Toronto Scarborough campus is very diverse, as they say. And so teaching first year students on, uh, you know, sort of intro to journalism, where you had uh, students from many countries, uh, especially from China and South Asia, uh, with very different attitudes about what constitutes reliable information. So at one point, I asked the uh, class a year or so ago, first class, what do you consider to be reliable? What, what information is reliable? And a young woman from Pakistan said, well, it's not Indian media because they lie all the time. And a young man from India jumped up and said, well, the Pakistanis are bigger liars. So it became kind of a, a way into thinking about uh, what do all students, not just the internationals, but the Canadians as well, because they were just as dumbfounded by the confusion in the proliferation of, of media, especially on, in digital form. And so I kind of wrote it with that in mind. And what I also did, uh, you know, I was the ombudsman at National Public Radio for, for a few years. I, I ended each chapter with an ethical dilemma, ripped from the headlines, as it were, um, about where there's no easy answer, there's no clear answer. It's all, there's no completely right answer. So that each chapter has a, a, a journalistic problem that they can discuss in class and with some, with some guidance to how to approach it, you know, what sorts of uh, curiosity and appropriate skepticism do you need to understand journalism in a digital age? I was reading a piece, I was referring to it earlier, uh, Jeffrey, uh, that Ron Selag wrote for CJN about four years ago, and he was talking about your, your stint at NPR. It was between 2000 and 2006, was it not, when you were ombudsman for NPR? <laughs> As ombudsman, yeah. Right. And it was, and the piece, of course, had to do with uh, the coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But you were talking in there too about um, 
what it's like to be, the newsrooms are under pressure. And of course, the messenger gets shot in many of these situations, uh, not only in that particular context, but you mentioned the Indians and the Pakistanis. So I guess you, this is something that you've been experiencing for some time. And, and I guess it gets back to my original question. Was it easy to get all this into a textbook or did you have to sort of parse it down in a way whereby your audience was, would, would be able to better grasp what it is you're trying to explain? I, I, the latter, yes. I mean, I, I always had my students in mind as I was writing it. You know, what did they need to know? How, I mean, my, my sense of university journalism textbooks is that they're written for a kind of a graduate uh, class or a postgraduate class. And what I wanted to do was to write it for an, a really an undergraduate approach. Um, and, and the confusion, it's not, just, it's not just with young people, older people too, uh, tend to want to hear the news that supports their own right. claims and bias confirmation. So getting the students to ask, well, where does this come from? How do you know? Uh, should I forward this on my Twitter feed? Um, is my uncle Fred a reliable source and should I be forwarding his ideas to my friends? Yes. All of these things is sort of a desire to, well, to, to impart this idea that we need to kind of slow down a bit. Um, and we're just kind of, I'm, I'm overwhelmed every day uh, yeah. by the stuff that, uh, that comes across uh, on my iPhone or on my, on my uh, desktop. Um, and some of, and I've, I'm guilty of this as well. I mean, sometimes, as we know, the story is too good not to share, and even, and then it turns out not to be true. There's a picture, for example, of a bunch of protesters in Toronto holding up donuts on the end of fishing lines in front of cops, um, and it was sort of, you know, kind of cute. And I forwarded that, and then somebody said, "Hey, this is like two years old." And, you know, so it's easy to get caught up in the, in the visual appeal of all this stuff and the jokes, uh, but the jokes have, sometimes have consequences and yeah. we have to be really careful. And, and Jeff, what a new student in journalism, let alone a young reporter, has to uh, equip himself or herself with is vastly different from what you and I started out in this in the late seventies and early eighties in Montreal. I mean, it's a whole different world. Absolutely, and and they are. How, how do the best way to describe these fascinating, great young people is that they want to know this. They want to know how to handle this, um, but at the same time my opinion, is that the digital culture has downgraded the value of mentorship. And so you have these, uh, uh, and you see, you're seeing it in the newsrooms of the nation today, um, where you have this kind of revolt of, of younger journalists who believe in what they're calling a journalism of resistance. Whereas we older folk, um, you know, kind of took orders from our more experienced colleagues. Yep. Uh, the Montreal newsroom was full of very uh, interesting, smart, dedicated uh, journalists who believed in context. Um, and now I think the digital culture has kind of undermined that. If you can get your name and face and ideas out there as much as anybody else, um, why, what's the point in deferring to someone older who may not share your, the same values? So what we're seeing now um, is this kind of revolt of, of younger digital journalists uh, causing upset in various newsrooms. We saw this a week ago in the New York Times yeah. where uh, an op-ed by Senator Tom Cotton from Alabama got in where he called for military response to the dem demonstrators. And this created an, um, an uproar inside the Times newsroom. 
especially among these younger journalists of color who demanded that this, col this column should never have been commissioned. And the editorial page editor, uh, James uh, uh, Bennett, uh, was forced to quit. And Bennett is kind of a great journalist in my, in my experience. And he also handled how the Times reporters in the Middle East covered the Second Intifada, which was <laughs> very tough. Um, I, I can, anyway, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go into those war stories in a minute. Um, but, and we're seeing this, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, um, there's some turmoil at the CBC about whether there is sufficient representation of around issues of race and gender. Wow, it's just, it's just, a, I've never seen anything like it. And it's, it's, it, it's, it's hard to figure out, can there be an agreement between the journalists who want a journalism of resistance and the older experienced editors and managers who believe in a journalism of context? These are going to be very difficult issues to resolve, I think. I mean, they will have to be resolved. But because right in some now, ways, when it really gets great... extreme, Jeffrey, it becomes a kind of uh, a, almost a McCarthyism that goes on, a, a kind of censorship at the opposite end of the spectrum, but, you know, can be accused of being censorship anyway. Right. And, and we saw at the CBC with Wendy Mesley, who's one of the great journalists of our day back in Montreal, um, who was talking in, an, in a story meeting about doing something on uh, race, racial questions. And she mentioned in the meeting, um, this is, I, I don't have hard evidence on this, so this is what I am hearing, uh, that she said, well, we're going to have someone, we're going to be interviewing someone who's going to use the N-word on the air. And she used the N-word in the meeting. Yeah. And somebody in that meeting denounced her. Yeah. So as a result, Wendy Mesley's pro Wendy Mesley's off the air and her program has been canceled, subject to an internal examination by CBC management. It, it, can, it make, can it make for a press that's a hell of a lot more timid too, in many ways? Well, I think that's part of the issue. I mean, there have been, an, I'm, I'm sure you guys have experienced this as well, where you see something on Facebook or Twitter or wherever, and you'd love to respond to it. But you know that if you do, you're going to get trolled. So yeah. what, I, what I've told my students is, is that the internet, the digital culture, promised to deliver a broader view of the world. You know, we'll be able to to share and experience what life is like in small communities all over the place. But in, so it, it, there was a kind of centrifugal promise. But what we've had now is a centripetal reaction and people are, are retreating from these media because they can be so harsh. And so they're retreating into cat videos and pornography yeah. mostly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are you granted? Are you leaving behind your teaching career, Jeffrey, with the knowledge well, that still, you've got that you've gotten through to these young people? Oh, I'm still in touch with students that I that I taught for years ago. So, I, you know, I'm I'm avail I'm available for comment anytime. <laughs> and um, you'll have the textbook too. You can you yeah, throw you know, it at I'm, them. Anyway. I'm not. I'm I'm just stepping back from. Um, having an appointment at the University of Toronto. I was on contract anyway, uh, and my contract ended. And I just thought, well, maybe this is a good time to kind of uh, see what else is going on. And uh, I've also, just to let you know, become a grandfather. Oh, um, hey, congratulations. Puzzle talk. Puzzle thank, talk. You. thank you, thank you. Um, a, a baby boy born almost seven weeks ago in New York City, for Christ's sake. Oh my God! So you can't see him, other than FaceTime. That's right. Oh my, yeah. that's a that must be tough. It's a little bit tough, but yep. uh, it, FaceTime is wonderful, and this is a great kid, and we'll get there at some point. Well, being a grandfather is a whole new ball game. I can tell you, I've got two of them, and what, you fall wonderful. in love all over again. Well, that's what's happening. I mean, this is uh, this is. I, I think I think time is right to kind of 
look around and see what else is going on and and as as the as the poets say smell the roses um or the or the or the nappies you know just that sort of thing <laughs> who's publishing the textbook jeffrey wiley uh john oh. wiley and, uh, and okay. company and sons in Hoboken, New Jersey. Not too shabby. Good for you. My God. Yep. But, uh, Jeffrey, you know, we're, we're talking about the old days when it seemed simpler. I, I don't know if we're necessarily making that point, but when you were ombudsman at NPR, there are some stories that never end. And one, of course, is the ongoing conflict in the Middle East, whatever iteration it is, or, or mm -hmm. abortion, or mm -hmm. the rights of people of color or indigenous people. Uh, it's kind of like being uh, in a war yourself when you have to rule on whether a story has merit or not in an ongoing story, right? I mean, that could change in 24 hours, let alone a month. And you face some what? pretty major headwinds uh, at NPR, right? That's, that's putting it mildly based on what I was reading. Well, and in fact, um, I got two death threats that the FBI had to be called in on. <clears throat> That's a scary that was, situation. It was. It was not. It was not pleasant. I had to kind of hide it from my family because I didn't want them to say, "All right, we're going back to Toronto." Uh, it was. It was. It was. It, it was all. It was. In the end, it was all bluster. But at the time, it was. It was nerve wracking, and uh, especially after nine eleven, there were also tremendous pressures. Um, NPR sent a reporter and a producer to Tora Bora to find out, well, who are these people? Did we get hell for that? Um, and and when the, you, you may recall there were these anthrax letters that went around yeah. uh, after 9-11. Um, and even at NPR, we had everybody wearing masks and handling the mail very gingerly and all that sort of thing. And the reporter on that story was a great reporter, a science reporter, uh, because it's anthrax, so maybe it's science. Um, he actually got us into a little bit of, of trouble. Um, he called, he looked around at, um, there were two senators, one from Ohio and one from Vermont, both Democrats, who got anthrax letters. And both of these senators had proposed that when people are sworn in to testify before a Senate hearing, they don't have to say, so help me God. So the religious right went crazy. And, and the reporter, the <laughs> NPR reporter on the story, called one of the evangelical groups and said, have you been contacted? Because you've attacked these two, these two senators, have you been contacted by the FBI about these anthrax letters? And they said, you're accusing us of terrorism. How dare you? And I got interviewed by Christian Broadcasting. And so what do you think? And I said, well, you asked the right question. Then, unfortunately, the reporter made oops, an oopsie error in which he put their denial in his story, thus kind of smearing them, I thought. And I wrote, I wrote in my column that I thought he asked the right questions, but he should have, edited, he should have been edited differently. Well, they went. This one particular group went went very uh, aggressively and sued NPR and hauled my the president of NPR up before a, a, a House Committee on Commerce, which is responsible for public broadcasting. It was, and they sued us and they got some money and and one of the th <laughs> one of the things they wanted was they wanted my column to be removed from the NPR website, where I said, right question, bad editing. I said, but it kind of exonerates um, the religious group and kind of condemns the way the reporter acted. Said, no, no, we want it out. And uh, so they, they, they took it, they, NPR took it down. With, they asked me if they could, and I said, I'll take one for the company. And then they said, we want a one hour private session with Dvork. And I said, why? And he said, they won't say, will you do it? And I said, I won't do it without a lawyer. So uh, an, an NPR lawyer accompanied me. And bas <laughs> basically, they tried to convert me. Have you accepted Jesus? As no, no. <laughs> yeah. And I, 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 
I, it was just. Did it, the it lawyer was, laugh? It was, it was. I started laughing, and they said, "This is very serious, sir. You know, we'll, if you keep laughing, we'll sue you." And I said, "Oh, I don't." I'm, I don't I That's the religious right and American litigious. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it really is a different culture from Canada in that sense. I mean, uh, you know, people will sue at the drop of a, of, a, of a writ. And it's just, it was just, I was so astonished by that experience. Uh, well, there, there, must, a few things. there must be another book in there, Jeffrey. Oh, my wicked, wicked ways. I, I, <laughs> I suppose <laughs> there might be. but Sure. Uh, let me get this one out. Okay. We'll, well, I'll look forward to seeing that. Jeffrey, you've been very, very kind to give us some of your time this morning. And again, all the best. Hope you get to see the grandchild soon. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be too. Thank you. It's fun and such good memories of working with you guys in Montreal. It was a magical time. It was we a did, great really news. was. It was a good yeah. newsroom. It was a very good newsroom. Yes. It was, it was amazing. Jeffrey, anyway, thank you. All the best, Jeffrey. The thank battles, you. Guys. Okay. We we'll look forward to Take seeing care, the book. Jeffrey. We'll talk soon. Bye now. Yeah, soon. Bye now. Mm, boy, yeah, imagine, oh boy. Imagine trying to talk about the Arab Israeli. Uh, well, let me round out a little bit and get back to the piece I mentioned earlier, just to finish off. But to also sure the that, Christian right mm, and. Uh, that's you know, I hadn't heard God. that part. No. But he when he was he was the ombudsman for the national for National Public Radio, yeah. and he was dealing with and of course. He was talking about the pa Pakistanis and the Indians, and there's always this too. So, th so those who are pro-Israel think that NPR is doing a bad job of, of covering the situation. Those who are pro-Palestine, never the twain shall meet, and that's we we all know that. Yeah. But he had to fight those headwinds and 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 defend his team, who were out there doing a good job. And at one point, I was reading in the piece that uh, the Boston NPR station lost a million dollars in funding from these pressure groups. Holy mackerel! Yeah. Just because you mean WGBH or uh, uh, I don't know which what the NPR station they've got is. got several in Boston. I think yeah. yeah. So it's it's it, the, the stakes are big, but I cannot. I, we could do an entire hour just talking about the work he did there and uh, how you need lead underwear to go into work every day yeah. because uh, wow. And so, it's interesting to have <clears> people from other countries. Uh, my wife Betsy had a similar experience when she was in Kuwait. And uh, most of the people, you know, it was, was pan-Arab, but they weren't all Kuwaiti. They were from everywhere. Yep. Uh, and the way the Indians don't trust the Pakistanis and vice versa. But a lot of these people in the business you're in and the business my wife is in, public relations, don't trust their own, their own press either. Nope. They do not. They say the government comes down on Tuesday and in Wednesday's paper, there's the story. Yeah, and that's uh, pretty much so. They, they, when when Betsy started talking about the North American press, uh, Canadian press, and I think even Canadian and American press are vastly different these days, uh, they were gobsmacked. These smart young people said, "What?" Yep, you, I have a client. In a senator, it. he's an idiot. Yeah, I have a client in Asia. I won't mention the, the country, but I have a client uh, who uh, I work with a colleague who's based there. Um, and it's a whole other planet. It's a whole other well, world. Well, so. look what's happening even in Hong Kong now with what's all happening. that's going on after 97, after the, the switch over from British, if you will, rule. And look uh, what's happening, at what, what Jerry was talking about. And we didn't, not one of us mentioned Fox News up until now either too. Yeah, I wanted thing, to, right? yeah, we need to have him back on yeah, because a so. lot of people have been saying it, it's not news. Yep. It's, it's all commentary. Yep. It's all commentary on those so, programs. And, anyway. you know, the complaints you have about... Radio Canada, CBC being, you know, far to the left or this or that. That's... I mean, when you've got Fox involved, you've got advocacy broadcasting. Absolutely. It's, it is not news. Yep. Fair and balanced. <laughs> Good night. And on, on that note, our thanks to Jeffrey. Uh, tomorrow, Sheila Rogers tomorrow, is that correct? Yes, we have lovely Sheila Rogers. I've never tomorrow. met Sheila Rogers. You haven't met Sheila? I've never met Sheila. Oh, I've been a fan of hers since, since day one, and she's up there in the pantheon of, uh, of female person broadcasters. She's up there with Katie Malik and several others in my book, uh, someone that I could listen to forever. So, well, And when you meet her, you'll just love her because she's, she is actually what you hear on radio. She is smart, uh, able, but just so sweet. 
such a lovely, lovely person. She, of course, worked for years in Toronto. Right. She did the afternoon show locally in Toronto and the national programs. And then she moved out to, uh, to uh, British Columbia. So that's where she lives now. And I said, you know, we do it at 10 o'clock our time. 10, a, 10 a.m. Eastern. Is she? Yeah. Uh, she she, yeah. she, she said, no, no, I'm an, early, I'm an early riser. Oh, my. So uh, she's, she's up for it, and I'll, I'll send her the link, and away we go tomorrow at 7 Pacific. Excellent. I look, I look forward to that. Uh, Sheila Rogers yeah. tomorrow on this. And your microphone seems to be working today, so that's fine. But please install that thing that I put in the yep. mail two weeks ago so that we can make sure that it works. I thought, I thought there was a bomb in it with all the packaging no, on it. No. You know? Where the hell, you know, and you open it. <laughs> and then I thought, wait a minute. He, he, this is his idea of a no, joke. And you There's know what? All that, in it. all that tape protected the box from the spit that was flying in that car <laughs> when I got that traffic ticket. So there you go. God <laughs> damn it. Well, you know what? I'm in for five bucks to Are help you? you defray yeah. your cost. Yeah. Thank, yeah. thank you very much. Justice. Justice. <laughs> Justice for Ivan. Yeah, right. yeah. All right. Tomorrow. Add to me. Add to me. Right. Let me just make sure yeah, we're off. Jeffrey here. was great.